special lecture that is not part of the 70 most difficult questions. Nevertheless, it is somewhat related. We did speak about the soul, the various parts of the soul. In talking about creation, we went in a particular order, discussing the pros and cons, the various sides and opinions of those who have a difficult time believing that there was creation. So we spoke about evolution, what happened to the dinosaurs. We started from creation. We went on to speak about the soul, the free will, and the limitations of the free will, which we discussed in astrology and mazal, or predestination. In speaking about the neshama, however, we spoke about how unique it is. That, that is how we are different from the animals, that we do not do things by instinct. We do things exercising our free will, and that free will is a gift that we have received from Hashem, from God. It is divine, it is holy, and nevertheless, even though we have this divine spark in us, but because of the other half that we have, we're all half animals, not really animals, even though some people do behave like animals, but we do have a half of us that is physical and that is animalistic in nature, and that is what produces the continuous struggles between what we call in Hebrew the Yetzer Tov and the Yetzer or the inclination to do good, to do what is right, which is what, is what our conscience tells us to do, and what is against the divine plan, what the evil inclination wants us to do. And it is this constant struggle that all of humanity has, that has produced, unfortunately, many wars, arguments, and uh, all the many, many problems that human beings have created. And the reason I say human beings have created is because God is good, and everything that he has created is good and perfect. But we, through our free will, unfortunately, ruin everything. And a lot of the damage that has been done is man-made, basically. And eventually, we'll be talking about the reincarnation of this soul. What is the idea of reincarnation of this soul, that it, even after the human being dies, the soul does not die, keeps coming back. And what does it keep coming back for? We have about a year to go just to cover the many, many questions that relate to some of the difficult areas in Judaism that many people have always been wondering uh, what they mean. Difficult areas, difficult questions, and we will do our best to answer them, to address them. One interesting area for those of you who were not here last week, but you can hear it on EnglishTorahTapes.com and eventually see it on video as well in, on our site, TorahOr.org, is the evil eye. The reason I spoke about the evil eye and the ramifications of it is because it does have to do with some of the abilities out there that uh, are related to the impure forces. We spoke about the impure forces, why they were created, why were demons and angels created. All of that, all of those questions are part of the series. So evil eye is one of them. Tonight, however, we're going to be speaking about another topic, and that is Hakarata Tov. Hakarata Tov means being grateful. The opposite of Hakarata Tov, Kfiyu Tova, or Kafui Tova, is being ungrateful. Or for those of you who speak Farsi, Na Shukr. Okay? There's various ways of saying it, but that is, I think, the best way to explain somebody who's ungrateful. Why am I speaking about being grateful and ungrateful? We spoke about the soul, the neshama, how, be how beautiful it is, how much potential it has. And despite the limitations of the human being, and he does have certain constraints and limitations, nevertheless, one of, great, one of man's greatest mission, whether he's Jewish or non-Jewish, is to perfect himself. And perfecting oneself means working on midot. Midot is a term that we will not cover too much in this series. It is a whole series in itself, working on the various midot characteristics that all of us have. For those of you who were here during the series on the mini-series of astrology, that is when we spoke a little bit about the various midot, strengths and weaknesses that all humans have depending, of course, on their mazal, on the sign that they're born in, but also depending on their education. And I want to point out that you're not necessarily stuck with what you have. Remember, we have free will. We can control ourselves. 
even though we have certain tendencies and inclinations to be like this or like that, it doesn't mean we're stuck like some people would like to think and excuse themselves for what they do wrong because that is the way they are and they should be accepted. Yes, it is almost impossible to change one's nature, but one can control it, one can refine it, one can overcome any evil inclination that he may have, as long as he, of course, he, he has a reason for it. Nobody does anything without reason. And ultimately, that's what Judaism presents. Judaism presents a road map, the map being the Torah, of how to guide ourselves through this complex world and to succeed. And success is not measured in money or in real estate. It is measured on how good of a name or how good of a reputation we acquired during our lifetime. Because what we take with us is our name and our deeds, not our money. And because of that, the success, the greatest success that man can credit himself with is, of course, having a, a good relationship with his wife, with his children, with his parents. All of that is really part of Midot too, because that success is not natural. There are challenges, uh, and we spoke a little bit about that when we spoke about another area called soulmates and marriages, where is there, which presents uh, another set of obstacles and hurdles and challenges because men and women are so different. But we said that even if though people are different, even if people are very different, they can learn to get along if each one is, a, as we say in Yiddish, a mensch, if each one is a ben adam, a decent human being. Then no matter what the differences are, everybody can get along. Hakarata Tov, or the midah that I'm speaking about tonight, is a very important midah. There are many important midot, but this, as you will see, is very, very important, very special. Why are we talking about it tonight? Because it is related to the neshama. The neshama has many things to accomplish. Each, each neshama has its own specific customized mission. And as we grow older, we will discover it. The way we will discover what our personal mission is because our neshama will guide us there almost automatically. As long as you do not refuse, as long as you do not say no, as long as we're not lazy, we will be guided to the right people, to the right address, to the things that we need to do. And hopefully, if, if we have the merit, to the right partner who we should marry, or right partners, if you marry more than once, right? That the ones that will be your as a kinegdot, the one that will be your help, the one that you will be able to complement each other, all of that is guided from above. There's very little we need to do. But then there's the area of free will, the area of free will where, where the decisions are left to us. And those decisions have to do the area of midot, or human nature, character, uh, or self-improvement, as it is called. And hakarata tov is a very important step in working towards that self-improvement. So all of this was just a brief introduction. Let's begin. Rabbis tell us, Derech Heretz Kadma Torah. Derech Heretz Kadma Torah means several things, but the most common one, the most common interpretation is Derech Heretz meaning character, good nature, good midot, that comes before Torah. Torah is very valuable. It is our knowledge. It is our wisdom. It is our life that depends on it. But the Torah, as you know, consists of commandments between man and man and man and God. Mitzvot ben adam lachavero ben adam lamakom. The portion of Ben Adam Lachavero, the portion of commandments that relate between man and his fellow Jew or fellow human being, that comes first. That is the foundation of everything. Otherwise, if a person knows a lot and does not behave himself, Shlomo Melech tells us in Mishlei, Nezem Zahav Be'af Hazir, Isha Yafa Ve'sarat Ta'am. What good is it if a person has a beautiful gold ring? and it is in the snout, in the, in the nose of a pig. The man is a pig. He behaves like a, ki, like a pig. What good is it that he has a gold ring? It's useless, right? What good is it a person knows a lot of Torah if he's behaving himself like a pig? Or, Ishayafa, what good is it if a woman is beautiful on the outside, on the surface, but she's completely rotten on the inside, the saratam. So therefore, Derech Heretz Kadmala Torah, one has to have a good foundation a good character, 
then whatever Torah that he learns will actually be an asset. It will be a very good acquisition. It will, it will complement him even more. But if he does not have the derech heretz, the good midot, the good behavior, good character, then the Torah will be useless. It will even be a poison. Instead of being a benefit, it will be worse. You will be worse off knowing Torah. So the right order is to work on one's midot. Obviously, as children, we don't get to choose. We absorb Torah as we grow. And midot, throughout our lifetime, we're working on it continuously. You never finish working on midot. Midot, however, are much more difficult because it is very difficult to change one's midot. It's almost impossible. And we're continuously working to, uh, to basically keep control over our nature, to refine it. Why is that so important? Not only because without it, life is worthless. Not only is this the most important achievement, but we've been talking a little bit about physical growth. We have a baby growing up to six foot nine sometimes and playing basketball, right? Being tall, physically, weighing 250 pounds. That physical growth will happen almost automatically. You just pour down a little bit of cereal and milk into that baby's mouth. You add a little bit of vegetables and fruits from time to time, and this machine will grow, sometimes very, very tall. There's very little you have to do to receive that physical growth. The growth that matters the most, however, that, does, that depends on a lot of work, is midot. Refining one's character, working on acquiring the right midot. Hakarat tov, being grateful, is one of those midot that is extremely important. People think that when we are grateful, we're doing something good to the other person. In reality, it's not so much for the other person, it's for ourselves. This midah of Akarata Tov, as we will see, zeboneta nefesh, it's actually one of the building blocks of the soul. Just about every mitzvah that we have in the Torah, he does not need them. He gave it to us for ourselves. You want to build yourself, you want to refine yourself, you want to grow into being somebody very special, if you follow this roadmap, you will come there. You will reach that destination. Hakarat HaTov is, is an excellent example of a midah, a characteristic that can help build the soul. It can really help refine the person. In order to understand a little bit how this midah is and why people lack it, we have to go a little bit into the psychology of human beings. What is the opposite of of recognizing the good that was done to you. Hakarat Tov means recognizing the good that was done to you. Somebody did you a favor, you say thank you. That's very special. What's the opposite of that? The opposite is being ungrateful. Ungrateful in Hebrew is called kfiyut or kafui tova. What is the root of the word kafui? It could either mean covering up, lichpot, kofe. In other words, you ignore what happened you make believe it never happened, or you minimize it. Kafui could also mean to force. To force meaning, zemagiali. What did the guy do? It's nothing. Or it's coming to me. I did him other favors too. So it's very easy for somebody to be ungrateful, either by ignoring, covering it up, or simply feeling that he owes you a favor. If anything, he is the one that owes you. Or, what did he do already? It was something so small that he did. It's nothing to him. All of that is kfiutova. Psychologically, deep down, the reason why people choose to be ungrateful versus to be grateful and to say thank you is because when you're, un when you're being grateful, you owe something to somebody. You're being indebted. Nobody wants to feel that he owes something to somebody. He wants to be independent, not dependent on somebody. The fact that somebody did you a favor creates a certain dependency. So you would rather not recognize it. You would rather not acknowledge it. And this terrible midah of kfiyutova is very, very destructful of the nefesh. It causes tremendous detachment amongst people. And detachment causes, of course, other problems, mahloket, arguments, and so forth. But the fact is that this is very destructive to the neshama. In the same way that a hakarat atov, as we will see, is very helpful, 
The other way around, the opposite midah of being ungrateful is destructive. Because it's so significant, I always tell people that this kind of a midah, as well as other midah, like being truthful, saying the truth and not lying, should be imbued in our children when they're very, very young. One has to be very strict about certain things at home, like not to lie or to say thank you, to recognize the good that was done for you from when you're very young. Where did this begin to take effect? When did this midah, this characteristic, become very prominent? During the time of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu, as a young man, noticed that his generation came in the wake of two major destructive events in the history before him. The Mabul, the flood, and the Dora Palaga. The Dora Palagas where they build the Tower of Babel, of Babel, and God disperses them all, and all the languages are born, and people just go all over the place. Abraham Avinu knows about this, he's aware, and he's saying, why did all this happen? What was going on in those people's minds? Where did they fail? And the common denominator where they all failed is that they were selfish. Either it was kina or tava or kavod. Either it was jealousy or the pursuit of one's desires or the pursuit of, of one's honor and image, right? All of that, everything themselves, they were pursuing their own selfish needs. And because they pursued their own selfish needs, the world was not going anywhere. It was falling apart. And this was not God's plan. Abraham Avinu therefore embarks on a holy mission. What is the mission of Abraham? To teach people to recognize who the boss is. They were forgetting about that too. They, beca they became pagan. His mission was to convince everybody that there is one God, monotheism. And how did he do it? By using chesed. Abraham Avinu knew the secret that the world is built by chesed, by kindness, not by selfishness. You want to have a normal world? You want to have a normal relationship, husband and wife? You have to have kindness. You have to be giving and not taking. Olam chesed yibane. The world is built through kindness. So how do I convince people to be kind to each other and at the same time tell them that there is a God in this world? I'm going to convince them and demonstrate to them how this God is kind to them, how he's so good to them, how he's so giving to them. God does not take, he only gives. So after he introduced them, after he brought them in and welcomed them into his tent and he gave them to eat and drink, he says, make a blessing. Make a blessing to who? To you? No, not to me. To my boss. Who's your boss? Him. Who's him? Does he have a business card? Right? <laughs> right? What's that? What's him? Who's him? So that is how he got into a conversation that we must recognize that everything in this world is so beautiful. Everything we owe to him. We say a blessing before we put something into our mouth. We say a blessing after we finish eating something and we're satisfied and happy. We give thanks to the one who made this all possible. It was not our PhD. It was not our hard work in the field. We get a little credit for, of course, being involved, but the one who's responsible for our success, for, for allowing this to happen, is him. And not everybody recognizes this. So Abraham, Avin, Abraham Avinu's mission was to prove, to convince this point very, very clearly. So he did this through chesed. He did this through kindness by reminding everybody that he's the kindest of all. Look how kind he is to you. You have such a beautiful working body. Do you know what would happen if, if the kidneys would stop working? Chaz Shalom. And we know what happens when they stop working. There's a lot of people like that in the hospitals with dialysis, etc. Right? So this is something that people do not ponder. They don't think about it. And therefore, they don't, they don't realize it. But if you, if you stop to think for a moment how lucky we are how many people are so unfortunate, you have what to think about. You, and, but who should you thank? Not your parents necessarily, in this case, or even though we thank them too, to thank the Almighty. That is where gratefulness begins, but that's not where it ends. In order to, to inculcate, to imbue this point stronger in the human psyche, in, in our neshama, the Torah comes up with an interesting mitzvah called marriage which we spoke a little bit about what the idea behind marriage is. It's not just about reproducing. It's not just about having children. It's not just about having physical help in the home. It is about giving. Since man in his nature is a taker, how do we get him to become a giver? Well, we give him a woman. 
and he's going to have to give her a lot, a lot, a lot of attention and love and etc., etc., etc. And oy va boy, if he doesn't, <laughs> if he doesn't, it's going to be problems because she will demand it of him. She will need it very, very much. The Torah says, the Torah says she will very much need it. She will be dependent on you for that. And if you don't give it, if you hold it back, well, that's why we have so many divorces. You should know, and I repeat it again, 95%, maybe 94, 96, but approximately, I'm convinced that most divorces could have been prevented, could have been avoided. There's some that are unavoidable, but the majority could have if people would not be selfish, if they wouldn't think of themselves. And this applies to both men and women. Marriage is a system, a system where one has to learn to give to the other. And giving requires sometimes compromises, it requires sacrifices, it sometimes means that you don't go first, that you don't come first. And that is what the Torah had in mind. In, that, in order to allow this to happen, the Torah tells us, listen, the only way this can work, partially, is Honoring one's parents goes on forever, even after their death. We light, we light a candle, we say Kaddish for them. We always have to honor our parents, even though we may disagree with them. But you know what, when you get married, Priority number one is husband and wife. Priority number two is children. Priority number three is parents. Number four, brothers and sisters. Number five, neighbors and friends maybe. There are, there's something called priorities, and some people forget about those priorities. And some men and women are very much attached to a parent, a mother or father, and that causes problems, especially when they interfere in the marriage. They destroy the relationship. You may have to move to another city if you want to save your marriage, and one's marriage should be more important than anything else in the world. If people look at marriage that way, if that is their attitude, as I said before, if you go to the chuppah with the intention to succeed and not to fail, and in other words, you're prepared to do everything in the world to succeed, then you may have to leave out some people that are interfering, even though they were very dear to you, because hopefully your wife or your husband is the dearest one of all. Hopefully. That's the way it should be. And if it does happen that way, then you should have a very successful, long-lasting relationship. But guess what happens? Even in the most beautiful relationships, your wife makes you a good dinner and you forget to say thank you. I said you forget. Why you forget? Because there's something called habits. We're used to it. When do we open up our mouth? Well, something is wrong. Something is not right. But to open up our mouth that something is right, we're just not used to it. And saying thank you can sometimes be forgotten, whether it's one's wife or one's mother. Oh, mom always makes something. It's, it, that's, that's why she's mother, right? She's supposed to be making dinner. Not necessarily. She's not supposed to be making anything. So we take it for granted. We get used to it, and all of that hergelim that getting used to produces a certain, I think an English word would be for it, a good English word, equanimity. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that or perhaps a better word, an indifference. In other words, we're not very uh, sensitive to how much of a difference this would make if we would say a word like, it was great tonight, even though we're exaggerating. It's okay for Shalom Vayd, remember? For peace and home, it's okay to exaggerate a little bit. It produces peace for another 10 minutes, right? So therefore, whatever it takes to produce peace for another 10, 15 minutes, do it especially if it doesn't cost money, right? So a word, a nice word doesn't cost money, but people are cheap for some reason. Why are they cheap? Because they just got used to not saying anything. They eat, they get up, and they go, and they leave. But these words would make a big difference. Do you know what a difference it would be if somebody gets used to telling his wife or her husband, you know, you look great, how special, how nice, how tasty. These things make a difference. These are called building blocks of any relationship. And many of us are guilty, are guilty of not using them. Not guilty because we don't want to. Guilty simply because we forget, we don't realize, or we get used to it. That is why it is important that we instill early on, as early on as possible, all of these trunot, all of these characteristics, these positive characteristics, because this is what builds the man. We're talking about refining human nature. We're talking about having this neshama grow, not just the physical body grow. This is how the neshama, this is how the true human being grows, not physically, but spiritually, by developing 
early on, very good, very positive traits. I want to give you a few examples of what the Torah shares with us that even though it appears totally unrelated, but the commentaries tell us that they are, these incidents are very much related to what's called Hakarata Tov. And it just happens to be, I didn't plan it that way, but it just happens to be that these parshiot that we're reading now in the Torah, Shemot, Vaira, Bo, have to do with Hakarata Tov, that we learn from certain incidents. All of you are familiar with the Ten Plagues? Who's in charge of bringing the Ten Plagues on Egypt? Moshe and his brother Aaron. However, when it comes to Dam Sfardea Kinim, the first three, blood, turning the water into blood, bringing frogs and lice, Moshe is not directly involved. Who is his brother? Why not? So the commentators explain very simply. Moshe as a baby, where was he put? In a little basket into the water. The waters protected him. Right? He was not harmed by the water. You have to be grateful to the water. Therefore, you can't beat the water and turn it to blood. You can't beat the water to bring the frogs. Neither can you beat the dirt on the ground to bring the lice. Why not? Because when you killed that Egyptian and you buried him in the dirt, so that dirt basically protected you from being discovered, right? So therefore, you have to show gratefulness even to inanimate objects. Inanimate, it has no life, dirt, water. We're not talking about human beings. If we have to be grateful to inanimate objects, that is a very clear, strong message, the more so to human beings. These are very clear messages in the Torah, embedded in the stories of the Torah, that are meant to teach us a lesson of hakarata tov, even to something as insignificant as dirt share with you a story that happened that also illustrates to you how Baruch Hashem great people in the past were very careful with this midah even with inanimate objects even though in this following story it does have a little bit of life during World War II there was a big rabbi tzaddik I think it was in Vilna who as soon as he saw the Nazis approach hid in a bush and Baruch Hashem, he was, he, I don't want to say lucky, Hashem of course protected him. But as a result of being in the bush, they didn't find him. And that is how he was saved. Afterwards, he ran away. From that point on, after the war, when he came to Israel, every year, just right till almost before he passed away, he would water all the bushes around his yeshiva. He would water the bushes because of hakarata tov, because of gratefulness to the bush that saved his life. An example of what the rabbis considered Akarata Tov, even with something that doesn't appear to have that much life. Nevertheless, they recognized that midah, and they wanted to basically uh, bring it out. In who? In themselves. Because if he would show Akarata Tov even to a bush, then obviously he would be, he would be careful in showing Akarata Tov to others as well. Another example in the Torah. Torah tells us we are not allowed to marry an Ammoni or a Moavi, the male. The male members of Ammon and Moab. The female members were allowed to root a Moaviyah. But the male members were not, were not allowed to ma marry from them. Why? For two reasons, but mainly for one. They misled you. Misled you by seducing you, sending their daughters and seducing your, your men to commit a transgression with their daughters, prostitution, znut. And rabbis tell us, Gadola Mahtiyo, you tell me now or go, one who leads others to sin is worse than one who kills you. One who kills you, he killed your physical body. Your soul is still intact. One who misleads you, seduces you to commit a sin, he is taking you with neshama. He is taking you from the, the world to come too, Hazrat Shalom. So that is much worse than killing you. And that is what they did. They got Jews to sin. But besides that, the commentaries tell us that they were kfuye tova. They are descendants from Lot, the nephew of Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu, the uncle, was so kind, so good to his nephew. And here the descendants of the nephews were not willing to assist us when we needed their help in the desert. 
אשר לא קידמו אתכם בלחם ומים, did not come towards you to greet you, to help you with food and drink. However, the Egyptians, guess what? The Egyptians enslaved us, they killed our babies, they really treated us very harshly. You're allowed to marry an Egyptian who converts, of course, after the third generation. Not before. For some reason, the Torah says, we need three generations to filter out the Egyptian in the Egyptian, right? At the third generation, he's ready, if they're converted. Only then can you marry. Despite all the, all the difficult times you had with the Egyptian, that he killed you, he made you work so hard, you cannot despise him. Why? You were a ger, you were an inhabitant, you lived in his country. He offered you shelter, you were there for a number of years. You have to show akarat tov. you have to be thankful, you have to be grateful for the hospitality, some hospitality, right? Nevertheless, hospitality, right? Are you going to complain if you have uh, a comfortable bed or you're on the floor as long as you're, you're protected from the outside elements, right? If a person offers you some hospitality, you have to be grateful. That is why the rabbis tell us, regardless of what one did for you, even if he just gave you a little bit of bread and salt, you have to be grateful. If he did something small for you, consider it as though he did a lot for you, regardless of what he did. And if he taught you something, if he showed you the, the right way, the more so that you have to be thankful to him. All of this is akarata tov. This midah, this very special characteristic called gratefulness, is very, very helpful in Avodat Hashem, in the service of Hashem. The reason why this one is very, very helpful is, for the, is as follows. The Sefer HaChinuch, in describing the reasoning, the logic behind the commandments, says that the logic behind the commandment of Kibbut Avvaim, of honoring one's parents, why do you honor one's parents? It's not just because they are doing you a favor, but when you realize how much they've done for you, that they clothe you, that they feed you, that they take care of you, that they raise you and protect you, you will come from that to realize how much God does to, for you, how He takes care of you, how He provides you with parnasah, with a livelihood, how He gives you life. In other words, the mitzvah, the commandment of honoring one's parents, will help you understand the aftayt Hashem elokecha, the mitzvah of loving God. How do you love God if you don't see Him? If you do, if you observe honoring your parents properly, this will help you and it will facilitate you coming to understand the importance of loving Hashem. So it's a springboard, kibbud avaim, towards loving Hashem. Same thing with hakarat tov. Hakarat tov, therefore, is a springboard. This one midah will help us achieve refinement in other midot as well. And if you ask, why is it so important for Hashem that we love Him? That, that is very simple. There's two ways to serve him. You can serve him out of fear or out of love. Which one is better? Love is a much higher level. So therefore, you want to achieve that level of Ahavat Hashem. Not that Hashem needs it. He doesn't care. But the service of him is much higher if it's done out of love. If you, if you do something out of love, you'll do it even if you're tired, even if you're pain. If you love somebody, believe me, you'll do almost anything for them. When you don't love somebody, just, you're just afraid of them, then if you, try to, if you can get away with it, you, you try to get away with it. That is why some Jews during the Inquisition were willing to give their lives, and some were not. It depends how much they loved him. Right? That, that, it all comes down to the level of love, or is it fear? Or maybe it's just, it's not even fear, it's just a, a custom, a tradition. Some Jews call themselves, we're traditional. What does that mean? Do you love him or are you afraid of him? Why do you do what you do? Anyway, there is a big difference between an individual who develops the Midah of Akarata Tov versus one who's Kfuit Tova. One who's developed Akarata Tov will, would rather not accept favors from people. It will be easier for him to be a giver than a taker. One who is always ungrateful will always be unhappy. There's many differences between this two very opposite individual. One who develops Akarata Tov will be able to see the truth or the good in everything there is in the, in the world. Where one who is Kfuit Tov or ungrateful will only see the negative. And I'm sure many of you know people like that who are very negative, who only see the bad, 
and those who are more positive. It's all related. These characteristics are related to this midah of being grateful or ungrateful. This particular area of Akarata Tov, in reality, goes back all the way to Chet Adamarishon. If you want to do a deeper analysis of where it all started, you know, with the lack of Hakarat Atov, it started with the sin of Adam and Chava. When Hashem confronts Adam, he says, why did you eat from the fruit that I forbade you from the tree? What does he say? Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, he says, that woman you gave me, she made me do it. So he's ungrateful to that woman who was supposed to be a great help for him. He was a fui tova. He's the first example of being ungrateful. So it all begins all the way from the very, very beginning that it's in human nature to blame others instead of blaming yourself. A person who develops the hakarata tov very, very strongly would not have that problem. And there's a danger here too. There's a danger when one is ungrateful to another human being, he will eventually deny the existence of God. Where do we learn that from? Also from Paro from this week's parashiyot. Paro? Yeah. It says there was a new Paro. Shaloya died Yosef, who did not know Yosef. Why does the Torah tell us that he does not know Joseph? Assuming it's the same one or one who was aware, at least, of what Yosef did. He may believe he wasn't aware. He was ungrateful. Yosef, the Jew, did so much good for the, for the Egyptians. Comes along Paro and ignores all the good. And what's the problem with that? The problem is, the danger is, if you're ungrateful to a human being, in the end, you will say, Mi Hashem Hashem Who is this God that you're telling me that I should listen to what he has to say? So the rabbis tell us, be very careful. One who's ungrateful in the end, he will deny. He may come to deny that there is a God. He's ungrateful to a human being, he will be ungrateful and totally deny that there is a God. That's where the danger lies. And perhaps, I wanted to add, perhaps, it's very interesting to know that throughout history, even though the Jews did so much good to, in every country where they were, Spain, Portugal, right? In all these countries, the Goy was always ungrateful. It, it is true that many, many people are ungrateful, but it's also possible that this was measure for measure. A measure for measure punishment to the Jews. Why? Because Yeshayahu Navi cries when he tells us, how could it be how could it be that a donkey and an ox, they know who their master is. They know who feeds them. And my people do not know who feeds them, who takes care of them. They don't reflect for a moment to pay attention to this detail. That's how the prophet calls out to them. How could it be that they know the animals and you don't? It's possible. This I want to add on my own. It could be that many times the Jews showed their ungratefulness to us because we were being ungrateful to Hashem. Possible. Yes? Right. You have a good question. Why is there so much chutzpah? Why is there so much ungratefulness in this generation? Well, it definitely is a sign that this is Mashiach's time because it was predicted that right before Mashiach comes, if you want to know if you're around the time that he will be coming, just look at the signs. And that is one of the signs that there is, unfortunately, the lack of respect and chutzpah, which is basically the same towards one's elders in the previous generations, which has caused a detachment, the moving away from religion too. Because if you're not respectful of your parents, you won't be respectful of their tradition. If you love your parents, you will love their tradition. So it goes hand in hand. And this is an unfortunate phenomena of this generation. Why does this happen right before Mashiach comes? It's a combination of factors. One of them definitely has to do with materialism. Right? There's definitely more materialism, more of an emphasis on materialism in this generation. It has to do with the Industrial Revolution, which has produced more materialism, too. All the machines, the standard of living, the lifestyle. 
right? That people have are not they no they don't work hard as the, the way they used to do. Just just, ima just imagine for a moment. We're, we all don't realize it, but it's it's very clear and obvious that today the family unit is not as strong as it used to be. People don't sit all together at the dinner table the way they used to. People do not go over to the neighbor and how are you doing. Friends and family do not come together as much. Each one is in his own world because the world has changed around us and has produced this kind of a situation. You have a family of brothers and sisters living all over the place, right? And not even talking to each other that often. In the past, people would send letters and telegrams. Today, it's a quick email, if ever, right? So many things have changed that have produced this kind of a symptom. So it, th those are some of the factors of why these things are happening. And they are, of course, indications that we are, we are at Moshiach's time. You know, this is the generation of Moshiach where these things will evolve. Unfortunately, they're not positive things that will evolve, but hopefully uh, some good things will evolve too, including what we're all witnessing is that there's a tremendous wave of thirst for Torah, Balei Teshuvah. That is the good thing that is evolving too, and we are witnessing that too during our times. In the Torah, we have some mitzvot that are Typical examples of Akarat Atov. We have the mitzvah of Bikurim, the first fruits. During the first three years, it's Orla. You cannot eat your fruits. You just planted a tree, whether it's mango, avocado, or lemons. You can't have the fruit for three years if it's a new tree, right? And you have to wait. Orla, that's called mitzvah Orla. Then there's Netar Avai, the fourth year fruits that if you would be living in Israel, you would bring those fruits to Yerushalayim and eat them there. And then from then on, you have what's called the mitzvah of Bikurim, the very first fruit of certain fruits. You would bring a sample of them to Yerushalayim, to the Kohen. And in bringing them, you would say a whole prayer of thanks, gratitude to Hashem for giving you the fruit. Pure Hakarat Atov, a mitzvah that is purely designated, or I should say designed, to instill in us the mitzvah of Hakarat Atov. Another mitzvah, another example of Akarat Tov is with a dog and a donkey. Meat which is taref. What do you do with meat that's taref? You just slaughter the cow, you check the lungs, it's taref. What do you do with it? You throw it in the garbage? No. Chaz shalom. You can sell it to the goy. Yeah, you're allowed to. Or you can give it to the dogs. La kelef Basar trefa. La kelef You dispose of it by sending it, by giving it to the animal. Which animal? The dog. Why the dog? He deserves it. The dog deserves it? Yes. In Mitzrayim, the dogs did not bark. Because they did not bark, the Jews, during the time of the plague of the Makat Bechorot, when the firstborn died, the dogs were quiet. The Torah rewards them. And we know for a fact, the rabbis tell us very, very clearly, that Hashem rewards everybody, even the smallest creature. Anything that you've ever done good, it will be rewarded, either here or in the world to come. Even the dogs are rewarded. The donkeys, because of their role when the Jews left Egypt in carrying the loads, are rewarded. They're involved in a mitzvah called, called Peter Hamor Tivdeh Beseh. Also another mitzvah where the Hamorim, the donkeys, are rewarded. All of this, examples of Hakarat Atov. Okay, we've seen, Baruch Hashem, some good examples of Hakarat Atov. And we know a little bit of what kafui tova means, being ungrateful. I just want to share with you an example of somebody that is even worse than a kafui tova. What can be worse than being ungrateful? Anybody know? It's called meshalem ra'a tachatova. Not only are you ungrateful, but you actually deliver a blow. In other words, you stab him in the back. You, you do to him something totally evil. Instead of recognizing the good, fine. You don't recognize it, so okay, you're quiet. All right, fine. That's also not too good. You're ungrateful, it's bad. It's terrible. But to return a disfavor, I guess we can call it, to stab him in the back, this man helped you get a job. He put you up. He found you a car, found you a wife too, maybe. Did so much for you, really helped you. And then you stab him in the back, you go against him, you do something to totally wrong against him, that's called Meshalem Ra'a Tachatova. I'm sure some of you have met such, such individuals in your life. Unfortunately, they exist too. People who will go behind your back, people that you've helped, 
Other people may, you know, they go behind your back all the time. But somebody that you've helped, not only is he not appreciative, he's actually stabbing you in the back. That's the worst midah of all. Anyway, human beings are human beings, as we said before. Each one has their problems, their strengths, and their weaknesses. But it doesn't mean that you have to remain like that. We have to work on it. And that is what Sifrei Musar are all about, books on morals and ethics. But in order to get this problem out of our system, we have to get used to acknowledging every good deed, every favor that was done in our, for, ours, for, our, for our benefit. And that applies to anything in the world, to any, anybody, not just human beings, even animals, as I said before, even a bush, as the example that I gave you. And as you know, there were many, many goyim too, non-Jews, that were very, very helpful that we need to be grateful to. They saved our lives. They're called Hasidei Umot HaOlam. During the Holocaust, one of the most famous ones was the Japanese consul in Vilna, who issued many, many visas to Jews to go to Japan when the Nazis were approaching. And it was through that visa that they were able to leave Poland and, and Lithuania and go through Russia by train to get to Japan. Transit visa. There were quite a few Hasideu Mota Olam, righteous Gentiles, as we call them in English, who we show our appreciation. And as you know, the, the rabbis do say that these Hasideu Mota Olam, Yishlaim Helek, Lolam Abba, they have a share to the world to come. I would just want to give you another example of Hakarata Tov that could apply from time to time, and that is. The rabbi tells us it's a mitzvah, lagi davar b'shem omro. It's a good thing to get used to. When you say something, you want to say something that is good, whether it's a bar Torah, whether it's a piece of good news. Give credit where credit belongs. He said this. This rabbi said it. That gentleman said that. Esther said b'shem Mordechai. Whatever she told the she said it in the name. She made sure to say it in the name of Mordechai. Always give credit where it belongs. Somebody said something, don't say, I made it up. You know, there are books that were published 250 years ago, something like that, where I think I've heard there was one or two examples where somebody went ahead and republished them using his name. He's the author of the book. Took all that hard work of that man that wrote, he's no longer around, he has no family, who's going to protest? There's no uh, patent on it, right? There's no copyright, I should say. That's Gezel. It's not only a lack of akarata tov, it's gezel, it's stealing something which is not yours. Give credit to whoever said it, to whoever wrote it in the first place. It's something that we need to get used to. Because of all that we've said, you can now better understand the meaning of blessings that we say. All the blessings that we have in the Siddur, it's basically all an example of akarata tov. From the moment we wake up in the morning and we say, Modea ni Hashem elokecha. The first thing that comes out of our mouth before we even wash our hands, before we do anything, is Hashem, thank you for allowing me to get up this morning. Some people just die in their sleep, you know. So thank you that I was able to get up, that you've re restored my soul unto me, and that I'm able to, to continue to live. And then you wash your hands, then you go to the restroom, then you make other blessings, then you pray. That's the first thing. Our whole day, our whole life, the life of a Jew is surrounded with Hakarata Tov by making all the blessings that we make. However, there's one blessing or there's one expression of Hakarata Tov that is very unique, and that is with the specific talents that you were blessed and that you were endowed with. As the Pasuk says, Kabed Tashem Meonecha. Give kavod, give honor to God from your wealth. That's the simple meaning of the, of the words. Rabbis tell us, Meonecha, the, the, the drasha is, Mimash Hashem Hananotcha. For whatever it is that Hashem endowed you, He gifted you. You have a special gift or a talent. Use that in the service of Hashem. You have money more than others. Use that in the service of Hashem. You have a beautiful, sweet voice. Be a hazan. You know how to raise funds? Raise funds for a good cause. Whatever you're good at, and some, everybody's good at something. You may not realize that, but you're, you're all special in some very, very unique way. Whatever Hashem has gifted you, whatever talent that you may have, give of that. Use it for a good cause. Use it to give kavod to Hashem. That is another way of showing your appreciation and not misusing it for something not good. Use it for something positive. That is a very, very powerful form of appreciation. 
Another example that I like to remind, especially some uh, communities have this problem more than others. Whenever a little girl is born, they're not too happy. If it was a boy, they celebrate, they make a brit milah, they invite many guests, they throw a big party. If it was a girl, they don't even go to the hospital to visit their wife. It's a girl? Okay, forget it. Chazu right? Shalom. Be happy, be thankful. It's a beautiful child. She's healthy. So what if it's a girl? What's wrong with a girl? Except for the fact that you have to start saving money maybe now for a dowry. Right? That's something else. But be happy. Some people don't have children. Do you know that? <laughs> people are, are crazy about having even a girl. Not everybody is guilty of this, but some people are guilty of showing a displeasure that it was a girl instead of a boy. Be happy, whether it's a girl or a boy. Be thankful that Hashem has given you a child. And show that appreciation by making a seudah todaya. By making a meal, a seudah, in the Beit It's something. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars and bring a Persian singer. Okay? No. You shouldn't even do that for a wedding. Right? Make it, you can make it economical. Make it simple. But show your appreciation. Do something to thank Hashem. Right? Do something to thank Hashem, even for a girl. I want to end with an incredible story that happened several years ago in upstate New York. This story is an example of how how from heaven they will bring about a situation which proves that there is a karata tov. Even from heaven there is a karata tov. In other words, how this point is so important. There was this uh, Jewish man who used to travel a lot to upstate New York long distances, many hours, and when he would go back down to New York City, he would try to get some sleep before, and somewhere in the road where there's a hotel, he would spend one night on the way to New York City. So one year he did the exact same thing. He got some good sleep so he can travel through the night, the first night. And this time, he took a station wagon with him. He usually never took a station wagon. This time he took his station wagon with him. All right. On his way down, even though he had a good sleep before he began his return trip, all of a sudden, for some reason, he feels very, very tired. Now, as you all know, to be tired and at night, it's not a good recipe for driving safely. So he realized that, that even though he usually stops off at some hotel later down the road, he decided to, this time to stop earlier. He didn't know why he was so tired. He already had some sleep. Anyway, he's tired, he's tired. So where this, the, the, the first building that he saw was an old age home for Jews. And he asked for a room there. They took him in. I think, that, I think they even knew who he was from the past. And uh, in the morning, the, the lady who was in charge of the place went over to him and said, you know, sir, could you do us a favor? Last night, one of the old people passed away, and he has no children. And uh, he needs to come to a Jewish burial. Could you please take care of it? You're going back to New York City. Can you take care of this for us, please? So he says, oh, for sure. It's a big mitzvah. Baruch Hashem, this time I brought, a, I brought with me a station wagon so I can fit the, the coffin inside the back. No problem. So he takes him down to New York City. Where is he going to go to New York City? He's going to go to his friend. His friend has a big yeshiva. And in the yeshiva, there are yeshiva boys. And before they go to the cemetery, they're going to get the yeshiva boys to attend the funeral. It's a big mitzvah. After all, where are you going to get people? You know, excellent opportunity to go to the yeshiva and get some boys. So fine, they all agreed. The yeshiva boys come out. And as they were accompanying this niftar, this dead person, to his final resting place, the friend, the head of the yeshiva, asks the, the other man who brought the, the, the deceased, tell me, what is the name? of this dead man. And he says the name. As soon as the rabbi heard the name, he became pale. He says, you know who this man is? He says, why, you know who this man is? Yes, this man all his life used to send money to support this yeshiva. All his life he supported the boys of the yeshiva, and now it was the turn of the boys of the yeshiva to show their respects to this man. An incredible coincidence of all places. This man used to support, send checks all the time on a regular basis to help his yeshiva. You think that will go unrewarded? 
You think he will be buried incognito in some cemetery without a funeral, without the respect? The same boys that benefited from his help were the ones who attended his funeral. Minashamayim, they made certain that they will repay him for his great favor. An example of how Minashamayim, they make sure that the Hakarata Tov takes place. I'm very much convinced that Bezat Hashem, if we get used to exercising this Midah and giving thanks to everyone, and especially to Akadosh Baruch Hu for all that he has done for us, then he will want to continue to bless us and to give us all that we ever will need, Bezat Hashem.